welcome, welcome, welcome to the Comic Corner. My name is Tim Gray. I'm your host, and today we welcome a man who quite literally is doing it all. He is the writer <laughs> of amazing titles like Moon Knight, Doctor Strange, Black Cat, and now some little team called the Avengers. Uh, I mean... A little bit. Coming off an Eisner nomination, the man <laughs> who famously does not miss. We welcome Jed McKay. Jed, thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, no problem. Happy to be here. Happy right. to uh, talk about comic books. That's what we do. <laughs> so I always ask, no matter who we have on, what your comic book origin story is. Like, how did you get here, whether as a fan and as a writer? Because I know you have a, a really unique and interesting story. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know how unique and uh, how interesting <laughs> it is. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I've always, you know, I grew up reading comics. I've always been reading comics. Um, I was reading my, uh, grew up reading my dad's old comics from the seventies for the most part. And, um, for a long time, you know, I wanted to make my own comics and, uh, so I thought I was going to, you know, write and draw them myself, uh, do the whole thing. But it became pretty readily apparent that, uh, I could not draw well enough or fast enough to make that uh, anywhere near, or, you know, approaching a reality. So around the early 2000s, I was really active on, um, uh, you know, various message boards, you know, the sort of, you know, proto-social media uh, for, you know, a aspiring artists, people, you know, wanting to make their own comics and, you know, networking, getting together and stuff. Um, so I hooked up with my friend Sheldon Vella, who is uh, it's an artist from Australia, and we would just kind of, like, make these dumb, crash, shitty comics together. You know, I'd write them, he'd draw them. Um, I certainly had no idea what I was doing. I'd, you know, I'd send him a script with, like, I think, like, 15 panels on a page and and he would just kind of draw whatever he, whatever he really wanted. So it would kind of come down to like, you know, four. And then he'd change the dialogue to fit. You know, we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, so I think, that was, I think we made our first comic together around 2005 or so. Um, so you know, time went on. And uh, Sheldon became, you know, fairly popular because he's, he's an incredible artist. And Marvel brought him on to do some stuff. And around 2010... Uh, he had a job to do a story in a book called X-Men Servant Protect, number four, which was an um, anthology book. So the idea was you take an X-Men character and a non-X-Men character, you put them together, and they have like an adventure for eight pages. And Sheldon's like, I, I, actually, I don't know who any of these characters are. So he's like, why don't you come in and write this since you know about this stuff, and I'll draw it, and then you know, that way we both get paid. And that was my first, it was my first published work, my first... Uh, paid comics work uh, was from Marvel, so I was you know it's pretty good. It's a, it a good way to get in. Uh, it's a good start. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean it's not bad. Uh, at that time, I was going to school to be a teacher. I was like, well, this this could change everything, you know. Like I could, uh, I might have like a career in comics. And then after that, you know, I emailed the editor again, like this. We had a great, I had a great time. Love to you know, work together again. And uh, didn't hear anything for four years. Um, Twenty fourteen rolls around. Uh, and Nick, this is the same editor I've worked with before, got Sheldon and I on to do another eight-page uh, anthology story. It was the, you know, the Spider-Punk story, and, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty well-received. People liked it. Um, you know, the proof's in the pudding where you see that character now in uh, the Spider-Verse movie coming out soon. And uh, so I was like, okay, this is it, you know. We got, we got our foot in the door. This could be, like, a, a real career. Because at that point in time, teaching wasn't going super well for me. <laughs> Uh, just because, you know, the, the work wasn't there and, uh, yeah, I didn't hear anything for another four years. So yeah, around 2018, uh, you know, Nick emailed us again. He's like, Hey, do you guys want to do another Spider-Punk story? Cause Spider-Geddon was happening at that time. And they're doing uh, Edge of Spider-Geddon. Uh, Sheldon was busy cause he was working for, on Ninja Turtles, but, uh, I was like, well, yeah, I'll do it. And that was my, my first full issue. And if that's kind of when it really started. Cause after that, I was like, well, this has been a lot of fun. I'm sure I'll see you guys in another four years. Like, you know, 20, 2022, I'll, I'm, I'm sure I'll sure you'll check in and can do like another eight to 20 pages or so. Um, but from there, I got Daughters of the Dragon. Uh, from Daughters of the Dragon, got uh, Man Without Fear, uh, Ghost Panther. And especially from Daughters of the Dragon, I got Black Cat, which was kind of my, my real kind of, you know, big book to, to get me going career-wise. And, because, uh, yeah, like, you know, Nick emailed me, because I, I think I, I had nothing lined up comics-wise. I was still teaching at the time. 
and um, I did Man Without Fear, and then you know, nothing came by for another for a few weeks to a month or two. I was like, well, you know, that that was a good run. That's fine. And uh, Nick called me up, and he's like, listen, I got a book for you. Um, it's like I really love Daughters of the Dragon, but we can't do a Daughters of the Dragon series. Like, you know, the numbers just aren't there. But it says we are spinning off this Black Cat book out of Amazing Spider-Man. And uh, we want you to take what you did with Daughters of the Dragon and just do that with Black Cat. And, like, I wasn't super, you know, super duper familiar with Black Cat at the time. I was just like, well, that's, you know, that is a character that exists. So I was super psyched because it, you know, it, was, it was an ongoing book. I never had an ongoing before. I did, uh, you know, some minis, a lot of backups, a lot of interstitial stuff through Spider Geddon. But this was, you know, my first real book. Uh, as far as this is going to go until it gets canceled, so you better make it real good so it doesn't get canceled. Uh, and you know, it did get canceled a couple times, but <laughs> it kept going uh, to oh. the point you know where we've got uh, an omnibus coming out next month, I think. And I have that thing ordered already. I know, I'm psyched. Um, I'm uh, I'm I'm looking forward to have that in my hands because you know mm. the the work I've done over the last what five five years or so. Uh, this is the first omnibus collection of my work, so. Yeah, you know my work and uh, all the people who actually did the hard work of drawing the fucking thing. But um, so yeah, and then it's just kind of been going from there. So twenty fall of twenty nineteen, I quit my job teaching, which was great because COVID started like four or five months later, and I certainly didn't want to teach <laughs> uh, do distance teaching because I had a lot of friends Famously, who did and it sucked. No, no. Uh, I mean, I'm, like I said, I have a lot of friends who are teachers, and uh, it was not a real high point in their careers. Uh, granted, not a real high point as far as writing comics went, too, because everything shut down. But, uh, you know, I had enough to keep me going. So, uh, so yeah, it's been been very lucky ever since, I guess. Yeah, so one of the reasons I wanted you to really tell that story in particular is because sure. our editor-in-chief at the Ages of Fandom actually was a teacher before oh, okay. he quit to go full time to really go in on this so i was like man i want you to tell the story give you like a little motivation be like see yeah. <laughs> it can work out man you got this well that's so, the thing like when i was yeah. like when i was teaching i was writing all the time i just but i'd kind of you know i'd love to give up on comics because it's mm -hmm. like well you know what nothing's really no, no one's calling me back um i don't have the time or the money at this point in time to to hire someone to do like an indie book or something because uh, i was you know i was working at a private school and getting paid real dirt wages so uh, there was not a lot of, you know, I didn't have like 20 grand lying around that I could uh, pay out for for art for like a few issues, you know. So, uh, but, you know, at, that time didn't go to waste. Like, mom obviously didn't go to waste. I was teaching kids how to like, you know, read and do stuff. But uh, personally, it didn't go to waste because, I you know, I was doing a lot of writing and I learned a lot of what I needed to know to make it um, in, you know, a writing career. You know, how to how to write to a deadline, how to put stories together, uh, you know, with relative quickness, that kind of thing. So when you were a kid, uh, was there a character or even now, is there a character that's like, that's my all time favorite character or a run in particular when you look back and you're like, that's, that's my run that I look back on. Um, a couple of them, I think. Okay. Um, cause I mean, when I was growing up, I was reading my dad's comics. So this is all stuff from like the seventies. Um, a couple in particular, the, uh, you know, Barry Windsor Smith, Roy Thomas Conan uh, stuff was incredible. It's it's one of those things where you start off with a guy like, you know, Barry Smith's, he started out as a guy who's like really kind of like the, the heavy, you know, early Kirby influence kind of thing. But like within, I don't know, six issues, like within a year at least, he completely transformed his style into something just utterly incredible. And that's always uh, something I've, it's, it's one I always go back to. Um, uh, Master of Kung Fu, when uh, Paul Galacio was drawing it, was it was just like, it's a book that took that kind of Stranko thing and just like cranked it to eleven. It was just such a cool looking book, and like everything was, um, it had a physicality to it and like an impact that you, I mean, that you want in a book called Master of Kung Fu. But it was just like, you'd see you know Shang Chi just put a guy through a wall, and it just it looked it looked like he was hitting him harder than the Hulk would in like a Hulk book, you know, it just, you could, you could really feel it. <laughs> so like, you know, Master of Kung Fu, um, and, you know, Conan are just, were some of my real favorites growing up. 
So I want to start with your latest title that just came out. You know, the the sure. Avengers, a small little book. You uh, might before, have heard of them. Yeah, you know. Before we talk about the story and the team, which everyone always talks about when it comes to this, I want to talk about your artist, CFEF. Oh, because, yeah. Man, he's killed it, and you've worked with him before. Was he your, like, your number one overall draft pick, essentially, when it came to doing this book? Oh, yeah, no, CF was number one with a bullet. Um, I, I tell the story in that, like, because CF came on the Black Hat for issue 11, I think. Mm-hmm. He did... Um, the, you know, the, the Iron Man arc. And he was great there. Cause, like I went back and read those issues recently. And he's just got like such an energy. And um, like, every, everything's got weight, you know? And that's that's something that I think is really easy to overlook in a lot of superhero comic books. But like he's just, he's got, it's got such, you know, inertia to it. And the thing is, he's only gotten better since. You know, we brought, he came back, he did the... Uh, King of Black three issues with um, um, you know for Black Cat when we re- relaunched with the new number one and like that difference from going from Black Cat twelve to Black Cat number one it was incredible like he's just he's just, you know leveling up so fast and with you know being a King of Black crossover there was like the Avengers were there and the X Men were there and it was like at, at such a scope and a scale that was beyond what we've been doing in Black Cat because I mean it's Black Cat. You know, she's not fighting Galactus, you know. <laughs> so at that time, I was actually kind of nervous. I'm like, man, I hope we can keep CF on Black Hat because, like, he's doing this, so it's such a good work here that I'm afraid, like, he's going to go to, a, they'll get him for Avengers. Um, and then, of course, after Black Hat, he went to do um, uh, X-Men. Mm-hmm. So, he, you know, you see the, the X-Men stuff he was doing during uh, Judgment Day. And, again, it's like this, this like, kind of scale and scope that he can do. So when I was talking to Tom about uh, Avengers, I'm like, listen, you know, I'm not sure how long CF's supposed to be on X-Men for, but uh, if he's available for Avengers, like, this is the, the guy I want, because I think, you know, he's, I think he's a guy who's absolutely on the rise. Like, I think he's going to be one of those guys who's a big superstar. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I wanted to get him while I still could. So uh, I was very happy that he agreed to join us. And um, I'm just really psyched for all the work he's putting out. Like, he's... He works hard. He loves to do it. He's very collaborative. Uh, yeah, he's just an all-around great dude. Plus, yeah, I think there's something yeah. very funny about uh, the fact that we're doing Avengers, and I'm Canadian, and he's Mexican, and uh, like you know, <laughs> Federico, the American the... team. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there, there's there's a part of North America that's completely outside of this, outside of like you know the letters and the uh, the editorial team. <laughs> that's that's the beauty of it, right? Like that's just kind of the beauty of comics. Yeah, and, for sure. You know, it's. Kind of like you, you always say you like to put wacky teams together, and this team particularly, not fa- famously not a wacky team, this is very much an no. A-tier team. This is your S-tier. When you yeah. think of Avengers, like, this is this is the lineup right here, right? What do you well, that, think that's, that makes... that's the point. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. what do you think makes this cast, this group, just work? Um, I kind of, like, it's a question that I've been asked a lot, because, you know, anytime you're looking at the Avengers, everyone wants to know, well, who's on it? You know, mm-hmm. who do you got? And I wanted this to be the like this is the one place you go to to look for all the big biggest Marvel superheroes. Um, you know, obviously Spider Man, Wolverine are up there, but you know this is this is you know this is a pantheon. These are the most important and most powerful characters, and this is where you go to see them all working together. Like, there's nobody small here. There's no one who doesn't feel like they have the, the stature to belong here. Um. And, you know, this this was a, a direction we got to after a bit of back and forth and trying to figure it out. I, I had a back pocket pitch for Avengers uh, well before I was offered it. Just so I was like, well, you know, it's a good thing to have. And it was, you know, all kind of like lower tier characters put together on the team. And, you know, I still think that was a good idea. But as I was working on it, as we were talking about it, it I realized, like, that's not really the Avengers. You know, like, that's, that's Secret Avengers. That's, you know, Savage Avengers. That's... Uh, you know, whatever other sort of adjective Avengers team there is. Which, and again, it's not to take anything away from that. Like, I love teams of weirdos. But <laughs> I feel like for the Avengers, it's got to be the heroes, you know? And, you know, I'm, I've never denied there's a certain amount of, I'm not going to say synchronicity with the, the Marvel Cinematic stuff, but I think that because these are characters, you know, all the characters in the Avengers are characters who are featured in the, the movies and stuff. And I think drafting off that popularity is 
useful. And also, you know, these are characters who everybody the world around knows in a way that has never existed before. Like, you know, 10 years ago, what, when did that movie come out? Yeah, like 10 years ago, if you said, hey, you know, what do you think of the vision? People are like, I, don't, I have no idea who you're talking about. You know, and that's that's not true anymore. Mm-hmm. So. Are you able to share who that original team was? Because I am so curious of that CD uh, list. <laughs> At least some uh, characters. No, no. I'm, yeah, I'm going to keep that in my pocket in case it's ever useful. Okay. Um, it's, it's always tempting to talk about like what could be or what might have been, but at the same time, nothing is ever wasted. You know, you, you put in this work figuring out, so like, there's, there's an arc for this Avengers that is just straight recycled out of a, a previous pitch I did for, um, I think it was a Fantastic Four pitch. I was asked to pitch on that a while back, and you know, it didn't work out, which you know, a lot of times it doesn't. But I was able to take a lot of that work that I had done and use it somewhere else. Uh, in this case, in Avengers. So, you know, it's, it's kind of similar levels of scale there. So it's, it's very easy. Um, so, yeah, like if that kind of stuff, I generally keep pretty close to the vest just so I can reuse it if I need to. Because, you know, if I start talking to you about it, I'm like, well, I guess I can't do that if it ever comes up. <laughs> Dang, it's out. Yeah. <laughs> so we've had Kelly Thompson on before, and Good. her run of Captain Marvel's uh, come to an end at 50 issues. Crazy. Like an insane 50 I know. What, issue. What a milestone issues. run. Like, it's, uh, it's the longest bonkers. Carol Danver Captain Marvel run ever, which yeah. it's been phenomenal. And I've loved the voice that she's given Carol. It's been a great voice yep. for her. And you've never really written Carol prior to this Avengers run. No, and she was I, in. Um, she was in Death of Doctor Strange for like a minute. Strange, but it was like it, an issue or two, right? Not. I mean, barely even that. Yeah. yeah. So I was going into this being like, man, I wonder what type of voice Jed's going to put to her, and it feels so much like you just picked her right off of Kelly's book, which I've loved. And just dropped her right down. I'm like, this is perfect because I love that run and I love this voice yeah. more. Well, I mean, like Kelly's. Yeah. I think Kelly's, you know, probably what like the the certainly the most successful, you know, best Carol Danvers writer in the modern era. Like, you know, books don't go fifty issues anymore. You know, <laughs> especially not like in one continuous run. And and it's kind of a situation of like, if it's not broke, then why fix it? You know, it's this is a this is a voice and a characterization that works, and I think it you know it suits the character, and uh, I think it benefits the character. So yeah, you know, it's it's largely a, a case of just you know <laughs> picking up that baton or perhaps stealing that baton and uh, just keeping on running with it. Because yeah, I mean, I'm certainly not going to write or come up with a new direction for Carol Danvers that Kelly didn't, and you know, make it work even though. You know, she she did this for fifty issues. She knew what she was doing, and it's it was you know very successful. The fact that it's gone on this long. It's it's been a great run. I'm so bummed to come to an boat and still getting more Carol Danvers in the Avengers, which is phenomenal. Yeah. I think she has another solo, <laughs> whether it's a miniseries or something coming mm-hmm. up later on as well. Uh, a character that you did bring up before is Vision, and the way he was introduced yep. in this first issue. That was super, super cool because I really liked the Judgment Day oh, thank you. event. Yeah, that was great. And just having that tie into the Judgment Day event where he was like, yeah, uh, spoilers, by the way. Yeah, sure. I didn't get judged. And yeah. it made him question himself. I thought it was such a great way to introduce that character, put him in the mindset, but then just kind of be like, yeah, but your vision, you've never given a crap about what yeah. others think of you. How much freedom do you have with Vision's story going on since every other character has their own solo book right now, except Vision? So do you have a little bit of freedom to kind of like yeah, mess I mean, with it? Like, you know what I mean. Well, that's the thing. Is like Vision's probably the character I have the most freedom to do anything with because yeah. it, does, it doesn't step on anybody's toes. Um, you know, Avengers is a difficult book because, or it can be a difficult book, because, you know, six out of seven characters have their own books. So you know, I don't have one editor; I have seven editors. <laughs> uh, such you know, such as the case may be. Um, and you know, you don't want to make life more difficult for your colleagues. You know, I've, I'll talk to uh, you know, particularly I talk to Steve Orlando, uh, you know, here and there, just to kind of make sure we're on roughly the same page as far as Wanda stuff goes. And, you know, Jerry's emailing me about uh, I mean, the Iron Man stealth suit and you know, how long we're gonna have that. Because I mean, between issue two and three, because that, that's the thing with a book like The Avengers is 
your book is going to have to reflect what happens in the characters' main books. It's not just something you get really in X Men, because you know the current X Men team, none of them have their own books, as far as I know. Um, whereas you know between issues two and three, we have three costume changes. Uh, you know, Black Panther's got his new costume with the new series starting up. We've got uh, the Iron Man stealth costume. And now, you know, the recently announced um, Thor Kirby costume coming up in uh, Immortal Thor. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those, it's, it's, just, it's just part of the business, you know, it's just part of the job. And uh, you, you try, to, try to do it in a way that is as helpful or, you know, as, as, you know, as minimally disruptive to the people who are actually writing these books as you can do. That does mean, of course... You know, there's there's certain limits on what you can do in, for instance, your character relationships. Like, I can't have, you know, I don't know, Thor and Wanda date because <laughs> that's something that would be probably explored in their own books, you know? But at the same time, this is, you know, it's still a team book, it's still the Avengers, and it lives and dies on its character relationships. And, you know, I may not be able to have, uh, I don't know, Black Panther and Carol go out to dinner, but at the same time, there's a lot of like really tasty relationship stuff, especially spinning out of characters' own books that uh, I'm having a lot of fun working with. Nice. Well, that's that's the most fun part about it to me when I'm yeah. looking at the Avengers is if you for those who do read those top, like the solo issues, you can then kind of see what they're doing when they are the Avengers or when they're not the Avengers, and it does feel more like a lived-in world because you do see like even subtle things like those costume changes. When you look at Thor, it's like, hey Thor, nice new look. All right. We're on yeah. with it. On to the story now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, there was oh, there's a great bit when uh, Grant Morrison was doing JLA, mm -hmm. and uh, it was Flash and Green Lantern were playing video games, but it was, like, Green Lantern ring video games, and uh, Flash, I think it was, yeah, it was Wally, I think it was Flash, and he's like, yeah, I was saying that, uh, I was just saying you needed a haircut, that's all. And then, like, <laughs> Electric Superman walks in, he's like, oh, you thought I needed a haircut? What do you think about this whole look now? And he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> Beautiful ways just to have nice, easy ways to explain something without needing to explain it in full. Yeah, you know, it's, exactly. That's how comics works. But one of the fun things about comics is creating all new characters, and we have an all new villainous team coming up mm -hmm. that we know of the Ashram Combine. Is mm -hmm. it more fun just to have like when you're in the Marvel universe to create? new characters and just be like i can do whatever i want here to impact on the back stories like what do you enjoy doing most in that i just kind of come up with weirdos you know <laughs> it's uh it's always fun just to make up new characters because a you don't have to worry about um again stepping on anybody else's toes it's, you know it's the reason why i use a lot of really kind of lower tier characters that maybe haven't been used in like 5 10 15 20 years because no one else is using them in their book but at the same time, you know, it's just fun to make up new guys and just, you know, working with CF on the combine was really great because I was like, well, here's their names, here's their powers, here's some like very vague notes about how I think they should look, and, you know, go nuts. And he kept sending me these designs that looked nothing like I had anticipated. <laughs> so, you know, I get, you know, it's really, it's a really exciting point of collaboration. So, you know, I'll say, here's a couple things maybe we'll change or like if we could, you know, adjust this, but for the most part, like that's way they look that's all cf just like looking at these names looking at these powers because at that point i didn't even know who's going to fight who mm -hmm. so um it's just kind of unfettered creativity and i think it's fun for readers like as a reader i love seeing uh new weird things turn up <laughs> uh, because you know it's it's unfamiliar with working with such a deep uh continuity and such a deep history sometimes you kind of run the danger of becoming over familiar with things so say, okay, well, I know what to expect because that's, you know, the melter. So things are going to get melted. Um, but if you throw something new out, you know, readers speaking, you know, from my own perspective and say, well, I don't know what to expect from these characters. I don't know what's going to happen. And I'd really like to find out. I'm going to quote you on this one because I listened to a podcast and you said regarding digging up weird characters, quote, you love to dig crazy shit up. Sure. Yes. <laughs> and that engulfs the research. I just want to know what that research process is. Are you just kind of like grabbing a random book off the shelf or wherever it is? Are you going back on like the old Marvel wikis to just start scrolling? Like, man, who who has like two appearances here? Oh yeah, I mean, I've got 
you know, I've got a window pretty much, or, you know, two or three times usually open on the Marvel fandom wiki just because it's so, it's usually very well documented mm. and they have um, chronological lists of every character's appearance. So, for instance, in Moon Knight, I was like, well, I need a shapeshifter. Uh, and I'm pretty sure the X office isn't going to let me use Mystique. So, uh, you know, just click the tabs like powers, shapeshifting, and there's like fucking, I don't know, 400 names there. And I'm just like clicking through them until my eyes bleed. <laughs> trying to find the right one like it's so, so someone who's still alive someone who is bad mm. someone who can well, obviously shapeshift mm. and someone no one else is using um and you know eventually you get there but uh, i think i was trying to find a, a wizard like a magician for uh, the first arc in black cat when they robbed the sanctum sanctorum yep. and i was going through so many magicians and i had like a short list and every time i got someone who was like even vaguely usable put them on my list and then you just keep working through and once i've got my shortlist i kind of work through and like, okay who's gonna work here which is gonna like who's gonna fit best in and you know finally we end up with xander the merciless who appeared i don't know in two issues of doctor strange like 30 years ago i was like great i can guarantee you no one's using his ass so uh and away we go who does is gonna be like oh my god <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we're, we're, we're being you know saturated with xander the merciless content here <laughs> Xander Mercer's solo issue one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, our editor in chief, TJ Zawarich, uh, met you in Calgary, mm -hmm. and he told you that I have a saying that apparently many other people have the saying as well, which is wherever Jed McKay goes, Black Cat follows. <laughs> Did you ever expect Felicia Hardy's name to just be associated with yours, just like that at this point? Because that's kind of uh, crazy. I mean, not really. Because I mean, Black Cat was a book no one really expected to do well. Because yeah. it's, I mean, it's a Black Cat book. Mm -hmm. um, so I think everyone was kind of pleasantly surprised with how it shook out in like audience, uh, or sorry, reader uh, reactions to it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when I started my planning, I, that was the first ongoing book I'd ever done. So I had no frame of reference on how to plan it. So I emailed Nick. I'm like, listen, what um, what am I looking at here? Like, what what should I plan for? Because I'm you know, it's ongoing, so you wanted to plan a long story that you can build up and pay off. But also, you don't know how many issues you're going to get before you're canceled. So it's like, listen, plan it for ten if we're lucky, but be ready to pull the ripcord at five. And I'm like, well, okay, fine. Um, but we just kind of kept kept busting past that. So, you know, we got past five, no problem, because we weren't guaranteed ten. Usually, you know, five is the biggest guarantee you can get, especially for books that perhaps... Don't inspire the most confidence, just given on, given like, because I mean, there's never been a black hat ongoing before. So there's no sort of model for what that would look like or like what sort of sales expectations you could have. Um, and yeah, it just kind of kept going. And, you know, even, you know, COVID shut it down, we brought it back and went on. And then, like, even, even when it got canceled, they're like, listen, we're going to, we're going to wrap up this Infinity Score storyline with a uh, giant sized issue. So you got 30 pages, um, you know, wrap it up and, Ended off in a good point. And I was like, ah, butts. Because, you know, like, I was like, shit, I had, like, an, another arc already planned out. But, you know, it is what it is. And then I think, like, a week later or something, Nick was like, hey, listen, um, they want to do something with this Iron Cat suit from issues 11 and 12. So we're going to do an Iron Cat series. Can you uh, get, get something right for that? I was like, that was the next arc. The next arc was Iron Cat. You knew that. <laughs> I'm like, you didn't have to cancel my book. We could have just kept going. <laughs> Come on. But... But I mean, you know, an, an opportunity for a new number one, like, you know, it, it is Marvel. So that's, you know, that's where Iron Cat came <laughs> up. And the way Iron Cat shook out is much different from how I originally intended it when it was just the next, the next arc of Black Cat. But yeah, it's, it was funny. Then, you know, we did Mary Jane Black Cat Beyond, which was really well received. We did um, a Dark Web Mary Jane Black Cat. The, that's the not, Eisner nomination. Yeah, right there. Eisner nomination, again, with, uh, with CFV. And, um, yeah, so it's she's been a surprisingly um, what resilient, I guess you could say, character, and that yeah, I you know she's she, she's stuck around longer than you would certainly expect for uh, for Felicia Hardy. So you know, very pleased with that. And it's I'm glad that people like it enough to associate my name with the book and the character. Uh, it's it's nice it's nice to have an impact, or a positive impact at least, uh, both you know positive for the character and positive for me. So. I think it's because when the book, when you talk about how you pitched that book, it's just kind of like, what is Felicia Hardy when she's like essentially not with Spider-Man? She's just being herself. Yep. 
And one of my all-time favorite runs is Matt Fraction's Hawkeye, which is, mm-hmm. what is Hawkeye when he's not being an Avenger? And yeah. it's almost apple oranges, but it's still, it's like the same concept, where it's like, what are they when they're just doing their thing? And I think that's really what kicked it all off, because you made an entire world for her. And that was yeah. like the coolest part, and you're able to just like expand on it, dig deeper on some things into the backstory. It just felt like a lived-in character, not just a supporting character anymore. Yeah, and like that was kind of the the remit for the book. I was like, well, listen, I unless it's a situation where it's like you know break glass in case of bad sales. I was like, I don't want Spider Man in this book. I don't want Spider Man in this book anywhere. Um, you know, barring exceptional circumstances like uh, the annual, uh, and then you know towards the end of the the Gilded City storyline. But I was like, you know, I really want to establish that this is you know Black Hat the book. Not like, you know, Spider-Man's pal, Black Cat, or like, you know, Spider-Man Presents Black Cat, or, you know, anything like that. So, I wasn't going to have Spider-Man dropping in and out, and like, uh, you know, featuring heavily in these stories, again, outside of the annual, because I think Nick had actually commissioned the... No, because yeah, Nicky was like, listen, we're going to do an annual, it's like, we want to do a thing that's like a, a Spider-Man Black Cat wedding. He's like, can you make that work? I'm like, yeah, sure. And so I was working on it, I was going back and forth on it. I was like, man, I cannot figure this out. Like, I cannot make this work. I don't understand. So I was like, I'll email Nick and tell him, like, let's do something else. And I think I would opened up Gmail, and I got an email from Nick. He's like, look, here's the cover. I was like, shit. All right. <laughs> I, I guess we're locked in. But then ultimately, I was really happy with how it turned out. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like, the, the first iteration of that was wildly different. There was, like, uh, Mysterio and Murder World and shit like that. Oh, and God. <laughs> It was it was very different than uh, kind of zeroed on the Magia stuff, which uh, I always liked the Magia. So basically, you know, what if the Mafia had ray guns? Jasmine Estrada from Marvel's podcast has a mm-hmm. literal countdown. Not a countdown, a count up, I guess you could call it. Yeah. Avengers issues without Black Cat. It's been almost like an ongoing joke on your Twitter accounts where it's like, when is Felicia Hardy going to show up in this Avengers run? I'm not going to ask you, but I will say, Carol does say, to avenge something, you have to lose it. And if you nope. do lo- I lose it... I think I lost you there for a second. Oh, okay. So you have me now? Yep. Great. So I said that Carol Danvers did famously say at the very beginning of the run, to be an Avenger and to avenge something means you have to lose it. Yes. Now... When you lose something, you may need to steal it back. So you never know when you need a thief on your team. That's all I'm saying. It's it's out. Yeah, it's it seems to be a pretty popular um, popular thought. Um, I think it'd have to be a real particular situation to put Felicia on the Avengers, just because <laughs> I think she would think it'd be desperately uncool. Yes. Um, so, you know, there's that bit again from that Black Hat annual where uh, back when Carol Danvers was. Uh, with uh, with Alpha well, running Alpha Flight, the the space Alpha Flight, not like the real Canadian Alpha Flight, um, where she's like, I think you know, breaking into an underground crypt with your ex that you just married by mistake. It's like I bet, I bet Captain Marvel doesn't get to do any cool stuff like this. No, she just hangs out in space <laughs> with Canadians. What a nerd. Um, yeah, like I, I'm not I'm not averse to the idea. We'll see if it comes up down the line, but. Also, also, part of the thing is, like, I'm writing Avengers. I've got seven fucking characters on this team. It's I don't true. need that anymore. It's like, true. it's already hard enough. <laughs> I feel like if she was asked, she'd just be like, wow, how desperate are you guys? It's well, like, she'd be like, she'd be like what, what's go, what, what the hell happened here? Either that or this, this is a great end to, like, whatever headquarters they've got and whatever stuff they've uh, got lying around. Yeah. You're, another book that you've time that the show is coming out, so there's a lot of intrigue into it. Yep. Just leading up into the show, leading up to the book, a lot of people just genuinely didn't know what the character was. I think the only yep. run I've read of it was Jeff Lemire run, yep. uh, which really worked yep. out if you were a fan of the show. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're not and, alone there. Yeah. <laughs> so you've had a few different artists on it, but the, the main one is Alessandro Capuccio. Mm-hmm. What is the relationship like when it comes to when you have a really consistent writer on it or when a writer has to step away? Does that impact your story flow at all? I mean, the writer rarely steps away because our job is a lot easier. Uh, as, but uh, it's it's not too bad. I mean, generally, oftentimes I don't really know which issues uh, Alessandro's drawing, which one's Federico's drawing. So mm-hmm. I just kind of because we're writing, I'm writing fairly far ahead. So I generally have some idea, but maybe not necessarily. So I kind of just treat the issues the same, um, and because 
I, I, like I, I script fairly loosely. I try to leave a lot of room for the artist to work. Um, in a large part, just because you know, they, they know what's going to work a lot better than I will. Um, so if it comes time to like, you know, compress, you know, uh, put panels together or split, split action out to different panels, then I'm more than happy to roll with that and just like make it work because ultimately if the book looks like shit, it's not me getting in trouble for it. So, uh, it, whatever, whatever the art, you know, whoever's drawing the book, you know, in this case, we're talking about Alessandro wants to do in order to make this read more clearly or, you know, make more sense or just look better then Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's been, like, it's been great to work with Alessandro so consistently for, I mean, what, issue 24 is coming out in a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's wild. And to see him develop as an artist is just really incredible. Cause like he's not a guy with a whole ton of credits and like, this is his first ongoing book to the best of my knowledge. So going from, you know, that first issue or even that like first one page preview thing we did in Avengers a couple of years ago to where he's at now. It's like this day and night. It's incredible. You have a great sense of humor, by the way. And this is, Oh, <laughs> thank I, you. I mean, I've been laughing pretty much this entire interview, but like, you really do. And I think I wasn't really expecting it in a Moon Knight book, but there's yeah. some damn hilarious bits and panels. Like the bit with Eight Ball, just kind of like, Moon Knight just kind of like get around the corner, just like, hey, and just, what? Ah, it freaks out, goes away. Yeah. Or the bit with Taskmaster, or like, hey, Taskmaster, we need to take out this guy called Moon Knight. He's like, what? And he's no, like, absolutely not. Look, no thanks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. like, like Moon Knight is by far probably the most serious book that I've been doing because it's you know it's, it's grim. It's, it's a depressed guy who uh, beats people up and it's got a you know a history of you know not removing faces but having removed a face. You know that's you only got to cut off one face and they call you uh, you know mark the, the face cutter. Um, so but you know I just really like having some gags you know some jokes and it's not often that Moon Knight is the one doing the joke you know occasionally. But, you know, sticking someone like 8-Ball in is great because he's just such just a fucking loser. <laughs> and really put, putting him up against, you know, a guy whose main superpower is that he has a horrifying um, history with, you know, the people he fights. I think there's there's a lot of hate to be made there. I think it's a lot of fun. You, you kind of need these moments of levity. Uh, it yeah. can't just always be, you know, rain and darkness uh, and, you know, people's faces being removed. What's been the most fun part about writing Moon Knight? Um, it's tough to say. I mean, honestly, I th- like there's a lot of really fun parts where, uh, you know, s- since starting Moon Knight, I've been kind of exercising muscles that I've never really used before, and being a, like a very serious book or like a very serious character. Um, but I think one of the most fun things is you know working with Alessandro in that that dude can just kill a splash page and it's made me more comfortable with writing splash pages because starting out I was like well I really got to earn my page rate you know and I write a splash page that's just like Moon Knight jumping off a building and it's like you know what 12 words I'm like well that's that's my page rate done you know on to the next one but seeing like the absolute just work that uh, Alessandro puts into these splash pages is just I think Moon Knight what what was it? Um, 14? The, which it, I think it was 14, no, 15? I don't remember. It was the one where the um, he takes those those assassins, the Nami and, and uh, Grand Mal, into the Midnight Mission and just basically ruins their lives. I think there's like yeah. five splash pages in that issue. Like, it's it's really out of control, but, you know, the moment that came out, that's that's what you see all over the internet. It's all these, these splash pages because they're so exciting and they're so cool looking. So it's been the Midnight Mission was such a great inclusion uh, for for Moon Knight just as a concept, and then just making it like a, essentially a living haunted house is just perfect. yeah. I was um, I've been doing like Doctor Strange reading, and mm-hmm. I was like reading the really old like Ditko stuff, and uh, that was you know, the first appearance of the House of Shadows, and I just like I wrote that down like I'm gonna use that for something because it's really good. So, uh, you know, six issues in, I'm like, all right, well, Zodiac's got to do something to hurt Moon Knight's feelings. Like, you know, letting the air out of his car tires isn't really going to do it. So why don't you just, like, blow up his house? And, like, well, if his house is blown up, he's got to have a cooler house. 
And uh, I was like, oh yeah, the House of Shadows. That was back you know, when I was trying to figure out Death of Doctor Strange. That makes sense, right? Here we go. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so you said you did, uh, were kind of like you found out when you were just like looking up stuff for Death of Doctor Strange. When you signed up for Death of Doctor Strange, did you... Was it kind of like expected for it to turn into like, all right, Death to Doctor Strange. All right, now we're going to do a clear book. All right, now we're going to no. do back to a uh, Doctor Strange. Did that just kind of happen? Yeah, I mean, it, it all came about when um, I think I'd finished Taskmaster. I was working on um, the Black Cat, King of Black crossover. And I was like, well, I needed another book to write so I could, you know, have enough work to keep going. And I was like, well, there's no Doctor Strange book running right now. I like Doctor Strange. Um, there's no Doctor Strange book announced, so I emailed Darren, the Doctor Strange editor. I was like, hey, can I write Doctor Strange? And uh, he emailed me back. He's like, yeah, sure. I was like, oh, well, okay. That was easy. Um, <laughs> then he was like, yeah, we're going to kill him, and you can do it. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> this is, uh, this is, uh, I wasn't expected. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that, that was, wasn't exactly what I was planning on, but uh, sure, why not? I'm sure we can make some fun out of this. And then, yeah, it just kind of, it, it was successful enough. Because <coughs> you know, when I was planning it, I assumed they wanted Stephen Strange back by the end of the book because the movie was coming out. And Jan was like, no, actually, it turns out they don't care. Just, like, let's do something different. You know, let's blow it up. So, yeah, we you know, left him dead at the end of the book. And um, Clea was a character who I had a certain amount of affection for, but I would you know hardly say she's a character I was super psyched about. And my, I think my first draft of Death of Doctor Strange didn't have Clea in it. And Darren E. Bomb, he's like, listen, CB says we have to have Clea in it. I'm like, okay, sure. <clears throat> and she, you know, turned into a character who really kind of stole the show. Um, she had she had such an interesting attitude and an interesting voice that kind of came along with her that she was sort of the natural fit to take over for, you know, Stephen Strange at the end of the death of Doctor Strange. Um, and yeah, you know, we planned out Strange, tried to figure out what was going on. We're like, well, he's like, listen, you got 10 issues, you know, tell a story. And, you know, we made the plans to bring back uh, Stephen Strange at the end of Strange. And then eventually she's like, okay, we're, well, we're, we're greenlit for Doctor Strange. You know, give us give us 10 issue outlines and uh, we'll see where we can go from there. So, yeah, it's, I'd like to say strength to strength. Uh, hopefully people are enjoying it and it continues to do well. But I've had a lot of fun working with Doctor Strange and I'm, I'm always excited for every issue to come out. I think one of the, the most fun things about that is uh, not like a, it's a triangle but it's like a fun just friendship triangle between strange mm. moon knight and clear right where it's like clear and moon knight are friendly with each other but moon knight and strange just absolutely can't stand each other but they have to work with each other in some situations i think everyone who is like no matter what yeah. job you've ever had you always have to work with someone maybe you just don't like so it's like hey you got yeah you, you need any no <laughs> type of yeah stuff. and the thing is like you know moon knight doesn't have anything against dr strange uh dr mm -hmm. strange does not like moon knight i think he's just you know anytime you're in a relationship your your partner has at least one friend that you're like man i can't fucking stand that guy um <laughs> And I find that really funny to do that with Doctor Strange. Like Doctor Strange, he's like he's very, he's very wise. He's very even keeled. He's very empathetic. He's very forgiving. And I just think it's funny. That, like there's one guy who just like really still grinds his gears, and it keeps running into him. And also, it's like he's good friends with his wife now. And he's just like, ah, man, are you serious, Moon Knight? Ah. Uh, moving on to you did a Magic of the Gathering book at Boom Studios. Yep which was great, by the way. Oh, thank you. And I am curious, like, is there a difference in terms of what you're allowed to do when it comes to, like, so you, you've worked in Marvel IP, and then you yep. worked with a completely different IP at a completely different company. Yep. Is there, like, a bit of a difference of what you are allowed to do, what you aren't allowed to do, like, in terms of approaches? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you know, uh, Magic was a licensed book, so you're, there's automatically another level. Like, everything you do in Marvel it goes to the editor's. And then they say, okay, we'll change this, fix this, whatever. Excuse me. And um, then that's fine. With uh, Magic, I was working for Boom, so I go to the editors. And then it goes to Wizards, who give their, you know, their blessing or their changes or what have you. So it's just it's another level of um, hierarchy as far as it goes. And you know, they're very concerned about maintaining the IP. They say, well, you know, we can't have this character do this, or this character has to stay on model. So there'd be a lot of kind of like... Uh, you know, art change to say, well, 
the sash is wrong or um, <clears throat> this tunic's not right or stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's certainly an added level of challenge. Um, you know, generally speaking, Wizards was you know very good to work with, but uh, it was just, you know it was a, a very different situation from what I was used to. One last thing on Marvel. Is there a story with Blackout, not a story, a character with Blackout, with Felicia Hardy, that you want, like, you're, you're still just kind of, like, itching to be like, I still want to tell a story with So, because I have a great one with Hawkeye, considering the Black Cat Beyond, the Black Cat Mary Jane, Black Cat Beyond, which, uh, sure. you included the Freefall element in there, which I've loved Freefall, Hawkeye yeah, no, I love my Free favorite character, and yeah, I was reading I mean, it, I was like, oh my god, I wasn't expecting a Freefall connection in here. Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, I, I kind of joke that uh, Mary Jane Black Hat Beyond is a, a stealth freefall sequel because uh, I really loved freefall; that was fantastic. Um, yeah, I've I've got I've got a few. Like there was there was gonna be an arc with Sabretooth that never happened because he was in a hole uh, at that time. Um, but it just you know it seemed like a, a character that would really work as kind of the antithesis, where you know Sabretooth is very much a criminal and always has been, but he's just a wildly different take from the kind of people that Felicia usually runs into. So, you know, I had, I had some good saber tooth stuff planned and, you know, obviously didn't shake out as soon as I read that, uh, house of X. Uh, yeah. Was that house of X issue where he gets chucked in the hole or powers of X regardless, whenever Hawks box was coming out. Um, then I saw that and I'm like, well, never mind, Forget that. Uh, I think that was also too, like it was before. Cause all that, all that stuff was just starting to, kick off and i think i emailed nick i'm like hey can i get like saber tooth he's like yeah don't don't make any plans for x characters for a little while <laughs> i'm gonna be a, a little busy and then later on it's like hey can we do a wolverine one he's like you can always do a wolverine one logan's always free he can just do whatever he I wants mean, you know, it's, if we had a month that wolverine guest starring in a book i wonder if someone was very ill <laughs> Do you have any last question? Do you have any advice to younger writers who just really want to get into comics and maybe they just don't know where to begin? Uh, yeah, my, I mean, my advice for young writers who want to make comics is kind of twofold. Uh, the first is uh, get a job, uh, like have have a backup. Um, you know, I've I've been very lucky to achieve a certain amount of success in comic books, but. My first published work for Marvel was, what, 13 years ago? So, you know, it's this this doesn't come quickly. It doesn't come easily. And there's literally no guarantee you're going to be successful at it. So, you know, I kind of liken it to the fact that, you know, I've, I grew up in PEI. Everyone I knew played hockey. And everyone wanted to be a professional hockey player. None of them are professional hockey players. Uh, in the same way that, you know, every... Almost every comic fan I know wants or, or has wanted to be a professional comics creator. So the odds of making it are very slim. And like, I don't want to say that to be like a real dream crusher or something like that. But it's just to say you got to cover your ass. you got to make sure you can pay your rent and you, know, you can eat because that's just the, the world we live in. But in less bummer and more constructive uh, advice, <clears throat> uh, the thing is, I've talked, I mean, even at that, that Calgary show, mm. talking to people who say, that, you know, I, I really want to write, but I just, you know, I can't, I can't get, figure it out. I can't find the time. I can't, uh, you know, get my ideas together. And it's something that I did for a lot of long time. Like I was in school doing my, uh, my bachelor of education and we read about, had to read a bunch of young adult books. Right. <clears throat> And I was like, at the time, I was like, man, I could write one of these fucking young, young adult shit. Like, it's, it's not hard. They're not long. And uh, so I started talking about, you know, shooting my mouth off. I was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to try to write a novel. I'll write a young adult novel. It'll be fun. You know, young adult adventure kind of stuff. And uh, got to be a year of shooting my mouth off about this. And uh, a friend of mine who I hadn't seen for a while, he came into town. And I was like, oh, hey, dude, I haven't seen you for a long time. He's like, yeah, I know. It's good to see you. He's like, how's that novel going that you were talking about last time I saw you? And I was like. Oh, you know, still planning, still thinking about it. Like, there's fucking zero words on the page. And, like, it was a real light bulb moment for me where I was like, man, you know, you can call yourself a writer if you want, but it doesn't mean anything until you're actually writing something. It doesn't have to be published. You don't, gotta be, you don't have to be paid for it. But unless you're writing something, like, you can't call yourself a writer. 
You know, an idea in your head is always going to be perfect because it's it's not real. An idea is everyone says, "Oh, I have great, great ideas." Like an idea is worth nothing unless you actually do something with it. You know, an idea can't disappoint you uh, until you actually put it on the page, which is one of the the kind of the scary things about it. The friends I went to school with are like, "Oh, we're going to start a, a writing club, so we'll meet every month and we'll read the stuff we wrote." And that was huge for me because I, I set myself kind of rules of uh, my own um, behavior where I was like, I'm never going to come to writing club without a complete story. It could be, you know, a thousand words, it could be 2000 words, it could be 10,000 words, <clears throat> all of which I've hit at one point in time for writing club, but I'm never going to turn up without a completed story. So that it began to train me to hold myself accountable. So it wasn't a situation where I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to write a novel and nothing is written. Instead, I'm like, well, I got a writing club in three weeks. I got to write a story. I had to come up with a story. I got to write it. I have to do some very rudimentary editing, and then I'm going to read it to my friends. <coughs> and, you know, I put all those stories up on my website. No one ever reads them. I've never been, you know, I've never sold or made any money off them. But at the end of the day, you know, I've got, what, I don't know, 85, 90,000 words of stories on there. And I learned how to keep myself to a monthly schedule. So whether or not those stories were successful, I mean, like eventually I wrote that novel. Uh, it has never been published. I've never made a dime off it. No one is particularly interested in it, except for my very kind friends. But at the same time, I learned a lot. And at the same time, I can point to that and say, well, I did do it, you know? So to boil that advice down is uh, if you want to write, you got to write. Uh, it's something that costs you nothing uh, outside of the time you got to spend on doing it. But, you know, when I was a teacher, uh, I did all my writing on Google Docs because <clears throat> whenever I had some spare time, they had a free period, lunch, or whatever, I just go on Google Docs and write even a couple hundred words just to keep it going before I got home and, uh, you know, finish the story or what have you. So that's, again, kind of a, kind of a long-winded answer to your question, but... Uh, <laughs> No, it's a great answer. It, it essentially it boils down to kids. If you want to yeah. do the thing, do the thing. Yeah. Don't just well, say you're going to do it. Do if it. you want to do the thing, do the thing. But also be aware that there's no guarantee of any success. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, the, the fact that I'm able to be a professional writer now is still something that kind of boggles my mind. It's something I largely considered impossible throughout my adult life, despite the fact I was writing the whole time. So, And you know, ultimately... It can't. It, it kind of just does come down to luck, you know. I've I got my well, my foot perhaps toe in the door, just because I had a friend who got asked to do some work and then asked me to write for him, you know. Jed, thank you so much for taking the time. Where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, my pretty much only public facing social media is Twitter uh, for the time being. We'll see uh, how long that lasts. They can be found at uh, twitter.com slash Jed McKay. That is J-E-D-M-A-C-K-A-Y. Everybody, go to your local comic shops to pick up Avengers number one. Go pick up all the trades of Moon Knight. Go pick up the latest issue of Moon Knight. Go pick up Doctor Strange. Go pick up the trades of Magic the Gathering. Jed has done everything. And go pick up the Omnibus, which is coming out soon for yep. Black Cats. My name is Damon Gray. You can find me on Twitter so long as I'm on it at Damon Tweet. You can find me on TikTok so long as I can still access it in this country at Damon Talks Comics. And you can find me wherever else a new social media app pops up because they just kind of sure. pop up wherever these days. Yeah, we'll see go to your last. local. Yes, go to your local shop, comic shops. Go support your local comic shops. Go support comics. We will see you next time. Peace.